Hi guys, welcome to Counterpoints. My name is Connor, and today we're going to be breaking down the excellent cinematic Morningstar The Hunt Part 2, or as I like to call it, Dark Age of Stardes. The creators of this animation series were responsible for the excellent Exodite animation on Warhammer TV, but they do want it clear that this is a separate science fiction setting from Warhammer 40k. For my ends, though, I can't help but notice aesthetic similarities to the power-armored warriors of the 40th millennium, and I think this actually slots in neatly into the Dark Age of Technology. So today we'll be talking about this universe's lore blended with Warhammer 40k prehistory, and if you want even more of that, then check out our Unified Timeline episode. If you want to watch the original uninterrupted and without lore, it is linked in the description, and I do recommend turning captions on. If you're new to the channel, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out our animation breakdowns and our real-life bolter video. This episode is brought to you by Hawkins & Company. Everything today is soulless and mass-produced, but not the wallets from Hawkins & Company. They're hand-stitched in the United States from some of the finest locally produced leather and come in a variety of styles and configurations. I carry the bifold wallet daily, but they also have trucker and biker-style wallets available. Use code COUNTERPOINTS at checkout and get 15% off your order. Get a wallet that's manly, rugged, and refined, all at the same time, today. Do you feel like there's something more beyond your half block? Something more exciting than the humdrum of your shift? There is, and we're waiting for you. There's opportunity, there's adventure. I this is the sanction. We have the exigent fleet in the scam factor at 005013. Sanctioner, be advised. We still have enemy fire coming from the moon. The Warhammer Dark Age of Technology was not considered a Dark Age by its inhabitants. In fact, most thought of it as the pinnacle of human culture, technological aspirations, and its ability to spread across the stars. From the 1st through 15th millennia, known as the Age of Progress or Age of Terra, humanity first colonized the solar system and traveled to the stars using cryosleep and sublight travel. This was reliable, but time and energy consuming. Humanity started using jump technology, but the distances were limited as some crews would emerge from the other side completely insane, or ships and their crews would disappear entirely. This changed with the discovery of the Geller Field, a protective energy barrier that eliminated collective hysteria and tall losses. This innovation allowed humanity to colonize the galaxy using faster-than-light travel. Star systems could coordinate trade and military alliances with surprising efficiency, facilitating exponential growth of the species and its territory. There were devastating wars against rival alien races, but humanity could always rely on artificial intelligence and its innovative spirit to create new technologies capable of battling these threats. So let's get into where the Morningstar setting takes place. Just because Earth was the birthplace of humanity did not mean people always paid it deference. As in all of history, distance, wealth, and interest can come into conflict. There will always be men who want to seize power for themselves. Several devastating intersolar wars resulted in regional collapses, begging for a new order. Now, the dominant power of human-controlled space is known as the hegemony. 
The hegemony doesn't care who rules the many solar empires, only that industry and trade flourish between systems. The macro corporations and their interests are given deference as entire planetary populations labor in the furtherance of industry. The exterior of these societies is saccharine, where all human desire is met, but for a price. The reality is that most humans labor endlessly for the corporations lest they be disciplined, docked pay, or disappeared. They are given only momentary and expensive pleasures to keep them under the order's heel. The Directorate is the military wing of the hegemony made up of volunteers wishing to escape the doldrums of industrial life. They instead maintain the airborne carriers, destroyers, and fighters of the Navy, and also serve as cannon fodder in planetary engagements. The heavy enforcers of this order are the Barakan. They are a gruff and aggressive tribe whose culture revolves around war as the ultimate test of human prowess. They happily take on gene modification and drug enhancement to test their limits, becoming stronger, faster, and more vicious than any human or alien rival. It is these same enhancements and regulating combat drugs that keep them in perpetual service to the macro corporations. Without regular medical treatment or injections, they become berserker monsters, as much a danger to their brothers in arms as they are the enemies of the hegemony. The Barakans speak a private language known as Utar, and they are outfitted with the most advanced armor and weapons available. Their exocarapus armor is powered by a miniature fusion reactor mounted in the backpack. The armor is sealed and capable of enduring hazardous environments and the void of space. They wield twin magazine-fed, twin-barreled, 70-caliber rifles with explosive-depleted uranium rounds. In close combat, they pummel their enemies with gauntlets or eviscerate them with a wrist-mounted blade. The blade injects compressed gas into the target, rupturing internal organs and blood vessels. The Barakan mission is to keep systems compliant through fear and alien threats eliminated through violence. Sapient aliens are a secondary consideration in the galaxy. Most are animalistic monstrosities who are pushed aside for human colonization. The more dangerous and intelligent of rival species are viewed as oddities and are hunted for sport. The exogen aliens depicted in this episode are something else. The Shigwe are a true rival to the human species. They have their own fleet, anti-orbital cannons, and warriors. They are escaping an unknown cataclysm and are looking for refuge in new colonies. This puts them at odds with humanity's gluttonous expansion. Where both parties have found a mutually desired planet or moon, the Shigwe have acquitted themselves competently. They have drones the size of humans, but their leaders tower over all others. So far, the hegemony has only encountered males, and their method of reproduction is unknown. There are also different perspectives on what the Shigwe believe to be honor. Directorate troops are cannon fodder and expendable in the greater good of human expansion. Barakan are vicious elite berserkers who hunt for sport. Shigwe warriors are the guardians of their civilization dedicated to the survival of their species and are self-sacrificial to that end. This is viewed as weakness by the hegemony. The hegemony is not concerned with this new rival as they have the galaxy's most powerful known army ready to deploy at their whim. They call these engagements hunts, dismissing the Shigwe as mere sport to keep their troops blooded. The 
the TX-1's reactor's been damaged. We'll get it repaired by the time you get back, but you better hurry and kill the platform's operations. I'm getting lots of pings from all over the hull. Won't be long. First contact protocols. Stock kill, pretty strong. Have a break. Pray. Weak. Close. These exogen are different. The Shigwe are shocked by the brazen assault of the Barakan, who slammed an armored personnel carrier into their orbital battery. A void shield prevents any more of them from being sucked into the limited atmosphere of the moon, but unfortunately for them, this room is not much safer. The Barakan emerge from the debris and cut down Shigwe as they recover. 70 caliber depleted uranium rounds rip through the aliens while the few return shots seem to just nick a suit compressor line. A Barakan uses jump jets to cross the room and finishes a collapsed Shigwe with his wrist blade. Compressed gas fires through the knife, rupturing the Shigwe's innards in a splash of alien blood. The slightly damaged Barakan is able to order the compressor line closed via his helmet, and the Hegemon ground forces have only lost a single mercenary killed in the crash. While the Directorate Driver affects repairs, the Barakan plan to clear the orbital gun. One of the Barakan claims he can do it on his own in a combat drug-induced Berserker Rage, while the Sergeant seems to understand they may be in for more than they bargained for. I, for one, am very much looking forward to a confrontation between the Shigwe Captain and the Barakan. If you want to support the channel for free, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell for new videos, and comment for the comment gods. Your viewership alone helps me in the algorithm and is appreciated. If you want to take your support a bit further, please become a YouTube member or join us on patreon.com counterpoints. Check out the other videos on the channel, support our sponsors, and I'll catch you in the next one. Until the end.